tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about tainted tap water and deadly deja vu. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of N.M. Brown and S.M. Small are voice talents Drew Blood and Olivia Steele. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by BetterHelp. When you're at your best, you can do great things, but all too often, life gets you bogged down and it's tough to perform the way you'd like. Working with a therapist can help you get closer to the best version of you, because when you feel truly empowered, you can take on everything life throws your way. If you're thinking of trying therapy, BetterHelp is the best way to go. It's convenient, flexible, affordable, and done entirely online. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched with a licensed therapist fast. You can also switch to a new therapist at any time for no additional charge. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Chilling today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Chilling. Now, get your ticket ready. Take your seat in our Theater of the Minds and Brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale of the evening is written by N.M. Brown and is performed by Olivia Steele. In it, we meet a mother faced with one of her worst nightmares. I've heard it said that there must be something in the water, but I don't think they ever meant something like this. Now, without further ado, I present to you Hurricane Warning. My teeth clenched in a tight grimace as pain shot down my left arm. I took a deep breath, stealing myself before looking into my daughter Cassidy's face. The look of terror and helplessness etched into her features wasn't one I'd seen before. And as much as I wanted to buckle at the knees myself, I couldn't. The second she saw how terrified I truly was, it was all over for us. The only hope we had of making it was by staying calm, rational, and mainly alive. 
I allowed a lie to consume my face in the form of a gentle smile as I released her hand from my forearm. The small crescent indentions in my skin from her grip didn't surprise me, but the droplets of blood sure did. I wiped them away on a nearby shirt absentmindedly, stroking Cassidy's cheek as I did so. Her eyes searched my face wildly for signs of what to do. This wasn't our first rodeo. Living in Florida puts you at risk for hurricanes for pretty much the last third of the year. But god damn it, this one wasn't supposed to hit us. I'm not an idiot, I know how to pay attention to weather alerts, the news, and all that other shit. Every year they show a clusterfuck of projections, graphs, noodle lines, and everything else to show the projected path of any tropical storm or hurricane. And I'm telling you, we weren't in any of them. For God's sake, we shouldn't have even lost power. But from the sounds I was hearing outside, we were all losing so much more. I'd been so lost in thought that I didn't notice Cassidy had latched back on until the stinging in my arm returned. My poor sweet girl, born without one ounce of hearing. As selfish as it sounds to say, there weren't many times I envied her condition. But now was certainly one of them. She was terrified enough without the swale of audible destruction taking place in our neighborhood. The pressure in the air was palpable, even to me. I couldn't imagine the type of thing she was picking up on. She removed a trembling hand from my arm, taking the first two fingers on each hand and sticking out her thumbs before placing them together in a stacked, swirling motion. Sign language for Hurricane. I placed a steady hand on her shoulder and nodded my head. I looked her deep in the eyes, moving my lips carefully to aid her understanding. It's going to be okay, Cassidy. Her father had been against learning to read lips, said life would be hard enough for her without having to learn all the extra bullshit. But I disagreed. Not because I wanted to make things hard for her, but because I knew she held the resolve and intellect to achieve anything that she wanted to. She'd signaled to me before that learning to read lips made her feel like she was in a secret club of sorts. It tickled her that out of a playground full of hearing children, she'd be able to get the scoop on the drama that belonged to the kids around the neighborhood. So many people focus on who is listening, that not many of them stop to think of who's watching. Now, don't get all excited, my kid's not one to stir the pot. She just likes to peek at what's inside from time to time. And if it makes her happy, the more power to it. My little girl ain't hurting anybody. However she feels comfortable, being a part of the world is just fine with me. Her tender fingers returned my arm, tugging gently this time. For the briefest of moments, I was able to catch a stillness in the chaos focusing intently. It seemed as if each tug from her hand was in sync with my own heartbeat. My eyes drifted down to hers, and what she asked me nearly brought tears to my eyes. Are we going to die? It wasn't something that I hadn't asked myself when I first realized how bad things would be. We don't have basements here to hide in, and from what I saw before the power went out, the quick-set shelters are almost literal mobs full of panicked and desperate people. Not to mention all of the reports in other cities of robberies during the last storm, both inside and outside of the shelters. That was one of the many reasons why Cassidy and I found ourselves in my walk-in closet, with my queen-sized mattress barricading the doorframe. As much as I hate to admit it, I wasn't sure if we should be upstairs or downstairs. Both locations were at risk for causing harm. Were we going to die? Who the fuck was I to say? None of this was supposed to be happening. Period. As many thoughts such as those flew around my mind almost all at once, I refused to further traumatize an already petrified child. Leaning back to allow enough space between us to move freely, I told her as long as we make safe choices, and stick together, we'd be able to make it through much worse things than this. A smile began to bloom across her cheeks as I bent to her level and assured her, no one's doing any dying today, Butch. 
Butch was a nickname my father came up with for Cassidy. If I have to explain it to you, then you wouldn't get it anyway. Before too long, she told me that she needed to go to the bathroom, which happened to be not far from our front door. Was it the safest thing to do? Maybe not, but I wasn't quite sure we had reached pissing on the closet floor level of danger either. Either way, I figured she could go to the bathroom, I could grab some more closet snacks and peek out the front to see just exactly what we were all dealing with weather and damage-wise. Don't pee your pants, I joked, reaching down under her arms to give her light tickles which sent her into body hiccups of giggles. Once I was sure I had her full attention, I made my best he-man stance and kicked the mattress out from in front of the door. However, I wouldn't be in a silly mood for long. My room was swallowed in absolute darkness. It almost seemed to suck up the brightness from our flashlights. Relief began to set in once the living area was in full view, and I ushered Cassidy to the bathroom door. The setting sun, though in turmoil, still provided enough light to see by through the unboarded windows. Unfortunately, the relief I found in it was shallow and fleeting. The floor's surface, especially by the front door, looked slick and shiny. My heart sank at the almost inevitable reality that water was indeed getting into the house. I reeled at the unfairness of it all. A hurricane has never come this late in the year and almost teleported off path like this. My soul was saddened for our little town. The wind outside sounded like a malevolent entity, hungry, dark, and all-consuming. That always seems the most terrifying, doesn't it? When things seem to take on a dark mind of their own, I mean. A cacophony of splintering wood and broken glass blasted from an upstairs room. I instantly sprinted back over to the bathroom, signaling Cassidy to follow me upstairs. The impeding water would soon reach the bedroom we were hiding out in, and the last thing I wanted to do was keep an eight-year-old girl calm in ankle or even waist-deep water. Branches twisted unnaturally outside as Mother Nature had her way with them, and the flood water was steadily rising. So I traded one set of risks for another and made my way upstairs to the upper bedrooms. As much as the roar of noise outside scared me, the sounds it left behind in its wake were much worse. My ears would have welcomed the Category 3 winds to come back and drown out the sound of desolate suffering, and maybe they would. But at that moment, all I heard were sobs, screaming, and the sound of more glass, with the most prominent seemingly coming from right outside Cassidy's bedroom window. The realization then dawned on me that my daughter and I weren't going through this alone. Other people and families were also trapped in the calamitous state of their homes. Involuntary grunts of pained bones escaped my lips as I lowered myself to the floor to look under Cassidy's bed. Stay right here, I told her. Only after surveying the area to make sure she'd be safe in my quick absence. I took tentative steps to the windowsill, taking a moment to be thankful for the wherewithal I had to have Cassidy and I put our shoes on beforehand to protect our feet just in case. Peering out, I could see that the water level had risen to mid-living room level of the surrounding houses. My gaze stopped when it met a pair of weathered, wide eyes. It was my adjacent neighbor, Mr. Adler. I wasn't too familiar or friendly with him, honestly. He had initially called Cassidy a rude child when she wouldn't answer a question he asked, or respond to something he had said. I had to explain to him more than once that she was born non-hearing. But some people, if that's not their life, they don't give a fuck, right? Well, poor Mr. Adler was certainly singing a different tune this evening. He looked so frail, perched against the edge of his window. He was hollering something awful. Mr. Adler? I shouted. Are you hurt? He shook his head, fervently pointing to the water below. His voice was clear despite the distance, 
An emergency operator had told him that rescue workers couldn't report to the area until the conditions were calmed and the roads were clearer. I feared as much, which is why I hadn't bothered wasting my phone battery trying to fight through phone lines for help that was unavailable, albeit temporarily. The old man brought his foot up to meet the window ledge, and from the direction he was looking, it was clear he wanted to reach the roof. In God's name, he's gonna kill himself! I thought, terrified at the prospect of seeing him fall. I called out to him. You know I had to. And you also probably know that it was to no avail. God knows what was in that water, but I can sure as shit say I'd rather him take his chances swimming than trying to climb on the roof. These weren't apartment buildings. There was no staircase or door providing roof access. You had to get up there the hard way. When I say my heart leapt in my chest and froze there, I mean it. I literally felt a frigid lump lodge between my lungs as I watched him use his weight on that raised foot to stand, turning, trying to grab onto something to hoist himself up with. The writing was almost literally on the waterlogged walls. One way or another, he was ending up in that water. What in the hell was he thinking? I didn't know this man's medical history. There was no way to know if he was in his right mind or missing medication. There could be a number of things that led him to try to escape that way. It was dangerous enough being as high up as we were. If the water didn't get us, a falling tree sure as hell could. Stop! You're going to get hurt! I pleaded. He stopped what he was doing to turn his head and stare at me before gesturing below emphatically. Stuttered words flew through his lips faster than my ears could understand them. He kept pointing down at the water. I don't understand! Can you not swim? Mr. Adler shook his head emphatically, letting me know that swimming wasn't the issue. He shrieked as he noticed the water level actively rising. Unfortunately, I noticed it too. The rain still whipped around outside despite the semi-calmed winds. My entire being was torn between running back to Cassidy and staying put to literally talk my elderly neighbor off of a ledge. Frightened tears prickled the corners of my eyes, though I knew crying would solve absolutely nothing. How was I possibly supposed to help this man when I couldn't even help myself at the moment? I was far from a concern of his, that much was for sure. He had gone right back to attempting to climb out of his window in order to reach the roof. My heart beat frantically as I watched him with bated breath. It was like watching two cars, knowing it was unavoidable that they would crash. But there's just nothing that could be done. All I could do was stand there, motionless, waiting for this man's doom. A faint vibration hummed against the soles of my shoes kissing my toes in quiet alarm. It was something I taught Cassidy when she was practically a toddler. The world is a busy place, sometimes even within the walls of your own home. If she needed my attention and for some reason couldn't get it visually, stomp on the floor. If someone was around and thought it was odd or rude, well, they could just go fuck themselves, couldn't they? All that mattered was that I knew, and my daughter knew, it was important for Cassidy to feel heard, especially since she wasn't able to do so. I knelt down beside the bed just as she raised her fist to pound on the floor. She stopped, mid-motion, and I honestly marveled at what a beautiful child she was. I was so blessed to have her. She wanted to know if it was safe to come out and look out the window. I told her she could come out, but had to stay away from all the glass in the house, especially windows. However, now that she brought it up, I couldn't help but think about Mr. Adler and his current situation. Waves of relief swelled through me when I saw he was no longer at his window. Hopefully, he'd gained the common sense to go back inside and seek help in another, safer way. And as I said before, I had next to no knowledge about this person. But if I had to guess, I'd have to assume that he lived alone. I did my best to scan the inside of the house for any activity, but regretfully saw none. 
There was one thing I did notice, though, that I was sure wasn't there before. A faint red streak kissed the bottom corner of one of the shutters that had managed to stay on despite the onslaught of wind and rain. I didn't want to do it at the time. And now, I wish I hadn't. Maybe then, Casty and I would be able to spend what could very well be our last moments, at least in this house, with a sense of togetherness and peace. But I did it. I looked down. Mr. Adler was laying face down in the watery grave that was once our shared bits of yard below. One arm was twisted and floated behind him at an unnatural angle, while the other remained tucked close to his torso. But his head... Oh my god, his head. The top quarter of his skull was gone completely, and the other side wasn't in much better shape. The brittle neck bone that connected the two had obviously been broken in the fall as well. I'd watched a hundred horror films, but had never even come close to seeing anything like this in real life. My stomach retched and I turned away to make sure Cassidy was out of his line of sight. There was no help for our poor neighbor. All we had to do was stay out of danger for a couple more days. As long as nothing big hit the house in the next 48 hours, we should be okay. I was just about to suggest that we move into another room, when out of the corner of my eye, I caught something stirring outside. Now, I'd heard of sharks and gators and all types of other animals showing up in communities due to confusion by the flooding rains. My first fear was that something like that had decided to grab Mr. Adler, adding insult to already fatal injury. But no. A cracking sound resonated up to my window from below as my neighbor's bones jerked and quaked beneath his skin. The way he rose to his feet was akin to a puppet on a string. What was left of his head lulled to the side, resting on his shoulder and bobbing slightly with each unnatural movement. He took a few shaky steps through the water with searching, empty eyes. The moment he saw me, he took off like a bullet. His broken form sped effortlessly through the water, slamming into the side of my building over and over and over again. Cassidy and I have been up here for what seems like hours now, and the sun has long set. She isn't able to hear Mr. Adler slumping against the side building, but I had no idea if she could feel it. I've managed to get her to fall asleep for the time being. From the muffling of noise over time, it sounds like he's banging himself apart out there, or at least losing steam. He is far from my main concern though. There are holes all throughout the roof. We can't seem to find dry shelter no matter what room we migrate to. I'm terrified of whatever is in that water to cause Mr. Adler to distort and deform the way that he did. But from what I saw out of my window, he's not the only one. I am desperate for help at this point. The rescue crews will hopefully be able to make their way out by boat in the afternoon. But until then, I'm terrified. Mr. Adler's still banging away and the water is pouring in. If you read this, there's something in the water. I don't know if you have to swallow it or if it can affect you by mere touch or even through a cut, but there's something in the water and it wants to kill us. I hope you enjoyed Hurricane Warning, as written by N.M. Brown and voiced by Olivia Steele. Our very own Drew Blood can be found over on his very own show, Drew Blood's Dark Tales, airing Friday nights on both podcast and YouTube format. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by BetterHelp. 
Let's talk about proactive versus reactive folks. Have you noticed people all over social media feeling sorry for themselves, lamenting this or that, and collecting care emojis from their empathetic pals? Don't you sometimes wish there was a ring your neck emoji? Don't you wish you could grab your virtual friends by their virtual lapels and scream into their virtual faces? How about a little proactivity? How about picking yourself up by your virtual bootstraps? How about getting yourself a therapist and facing your problems head on? Sorry for the spirited intro, folks. It's just that I care. And really caring doesn't have an emoji. It has a web address. And that address is betterhelp.com. What therapy does is it helps you identify the source of your personal challenges and learn productive coping skills to empower you. There's a reason so many empowered people use therapy. Success takes proactive decisions. And how are we supposed to do that while we're feeling sorry for ourselves? With better help, you can air your grievances in a productive way to someone who not only cares but has good professional advice. You can text your therapist anytime and receive prompt, thoughtful responses. Every week, you can set up video chats or phone calls. It's all done remotely, so you'll never need to visit an office. Whatever your underlying issues, be they stress, anxiety, depression, or even unique difficulties, there's a licensed therapist at BetterHelp waiting to help you get through them. You won't believe how easy it is. Sign up, fill out a questionnaire, and you're well on the path to empowerment. You'll get the time-proven treatment of professional therapy, but with a modern-day delivery system that's cheaper, easier, and more affordable than you ever thought possible. Take it from me, I've benefited greatly from therapy myself. If there's one place we could all use a second opinion, it's the ego. You know, that pesky little part of us that likes complaining and getting emojis? Not the brain's most proactive bit of gray matter. BetterHelp is the world's largest therapy service. To date, they've matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists. And I'd like you to join their ranks. The next post I see out of you, I want to see triumph. I want to see perseverance. Because unlike the rest of your virtual friends, I'd actually like to see you succeed. If you want to live a more empowered life, Therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Chilling today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Chilling. Thank you for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. Our second tale of the evening comes to us from author S.M. Small and is performed by Danielle Hewitt, Michelle Kane, and Nick Goroff. Well, it's the first week of February again, and the nasty groundhog has seen its withered shadow. At least in my neck of the woods, I've heard conflicting reports. And it's in that spirit that we bring you our next story. This brings a whole new meaning to the phrase, same shit, different day. Now, without further ado, I present to you, Repeat Offender. Life is weird sometimes. Going through life thinking everything is normal. Nothing bad could ever happen. Not really. In retrospect, that was an ignorant thought. I know better now. No one is safe anywhere. Sure, I don't live somewhere generally known to be dangerous, like the Middle East, where violence is as normal as eating butter on bread. But living the city life can be just as risky, easily. Danger takes a, a different form. You never know when you will be naturally selected to experience it firsthand. I've been living in the same townhouse for five years, and nothing bad has ever happened. Every day was the same. I would start my day at 6 a.m. sharp, stumble down the stairs, and make my morning brew. 
After a quick shower, I'm dressed and pulling the car out of the garage. I work in an office, the usual situation. It's what you would expect it to be. Computers, cubicles, internal corporate domination over a gaggle of underpaid and overworked average individuals. Nine hours later, I drive to the store, pick up my glorified organic food, and come home for a quiet evening. Nothing truly bad ever happens. Maybe a stubbed toe running over the curb every now and then. Occasionally, the toilet becomes inconveniently clogged, resulting in an overreacted act of unclogging and a sigh of exasperated relief as the water finally swirls away. I've been spoiled and jaded all at once, living such a peaceful existence. People don't think that way so often anymore. Peace is valuable. I miss it. One evening, I was sitting in my living room minding my own business with a book and a steaming cup of tea when something moved by my window. I didn't see anything definitively, but I knew the rosemary bush planted under the window had shaken. It was just about 6.30, so the sun was beginning to set, creating the mistiest gentle blue, pink, and purple hue across everything the light touched. My eyes focused on the window, pausing in a frozen stare to see if it happened again. Nothing. I shrugged and returned to reading fabulous facts surrounding our climate and what should be done about it. A black shadow crossed my vision and again the bush shook, and I turned back to the window quickly. It barely rustled and then became still, as though its disruptor decided to occupy elsewhere. Well, that's interesting. I said as I set the book down. I went to the window and looked out curiously, hoping to see a bird of some kind or maybe a squirrel. There was nothing of interest besides a grasshopper stretching out its legs. A simple rosemary bush. The doorbell rang, which made me nearly jump out of my skin. I stared at the door, a sense of anxiety building. I wasn't expecting a package nor any visitors. This struck me as strange, and I considered not answering. The doorbell rang out again, followed by three steady, heavy knocks. Something doesn't feel right. I'll go look out the window upstairs. I thought this out loud, hopping two steps at a time up the stairs and peering out the hallway window, exposing my front lawn and a large blue van parked in my driveway. No signage. Just a neat, almost new, unmarked blue van with black tinted windows. Tires were dirty. It looked like dried mud. This was strange considering there wasn't any rain in the area today, and my home isn't near any forests. This is the city. We have cement grass. Three more knocks sounded downstairs. This person did not want to go away. But seeing this van, I felt uneasy. There's no way I'm opening up for someone with your vibes, whoever you are. I mumbled, continuing to peer, hoping the unexpected guest would leave and I could see who wanted me to open the door for them. Long, stressful moments passed, and the knocking finally ceased. A pale man emerged from my entryway. He was tall, with a fluff of blonde hair bobbing as he slowly strode to his van, wearing a black shirt, pants, belt, shoes, and socks. He appeared nearly ghost-like. He stopped in front of the door to the driver's seat. He just stood there, staring into the van. Was he talking to someone? I couldn't tell to be sure. Was there another? Why are they here? Why is he still standing there? Why isn't he leaving? These thoughts rushed me. Anxiety continued to crawl into my mind as leeches seeped into my skin. Seeds of panic began to grow as the pale man slowly turned his head back to the front door of my home. His steady gaze slowly climbed the wall, and time seemed so surreal. 
eyes focused with an intensity I've not seen before. Up to my window, looking me in the eyes. My mouth fell open in surprise and I lurched away quickly, letting the curtains fall back into place. My heart was slamming in my chest now. He knew I was watching. He knew where to look. How did he know what window to look into? How did he know? How did he know? I took a deep breath and moved back to the window on my hands and knees. I felt foolish, crawling like a child, hoping my parents didn't catch me sneaking into the kitchen at bedtime. I peeked through the smallest possible crease in the curtain to look outside. The van was gone. It vanished like it never existed in the first place. I didn't hear the van start up. No squeaking tires or clang of metal. Just nothing. What the fuck was that? I got off my knees, ran my hands through my sweat-laced hair, and let out a flustered breath, taking in another shallow one as a poor replacement. I peeked through again, staring intently at my lawn. I felt my courage come back to me, giving me energy. Nothing is out of place. I know they were here. This is weird. Going downstairs, I checked the windows just in case. Also, the back door. You never know. I looked at the front door. Locked, of course, but I was curious. Unlatching the lock, I opened the door and stared out into the world. A beautiful setting sun, a quiet suburban street, a cozy doormat displaying the cheesy domesticated welcome message, who's there? A duo of colorful owls to emphasize the joke, and a rosemary sprig sits lightly on top of the biggest owl's face. Hmm. The next day, things were normal for the most part. My morning routine was the same, nothing out of the ordinary. I had a dream about the rosemary sprig. Thinking back, I wonder if my subconscious was more in tune with my surroundings than I was. Coming home that night, I scanned the roads for the blue van with the muddy wheels. The roads were congested, as usual, around the five o'clock rush hour, but no blue van. I pulled into the driveway and looked up at the window I was standing in the day before. The curtains were closed, as I would always have them. Today, I did leave a light on upstairs to give the impression someone might be home, just in case they came by while I was gone. Once inside, I brewed my tea and took a nap in the living room. My eyes thickened behind closed eyelids. They became so heavy the blackness overtook me as I drifted into a relaxing sleep, the smell of fresh hot tea wafting under my nose. I woke to an abrupt bang with a startled gasp. It was dark now, with just the lamplight illuminating my small living room. I sat up in the chair and listened to the now silent house. My breath caught in my throat as three hard knocks rapped on my front door at a slow, deliberate pace. In the same way, they had come from the pale blonde man that had come the day before. I felt my heart skip beats as I fumbled in the drawer next to me for the pepper spray I bought at the dollar store two years ago. Hopefully pepper spray doesn't expire, I mumbled, fumbling with the little plastic switch to activate the release just as the knocking began again. Peeking around the corner, one eye gets a clear shot of the front door, and blonde tresses shining so clearly under the porch light through the faded glass. Crap! I crawled on my knees through the living room and kitchen, hoping he would disappear. As I settled on my kitchen floor, I breathed in and out rapidly. It grew silent. Long moments passed again. I stayed on the floor, trembling with the pepper spray locked in my iron grip ready to spray the hell out of anything that dared try to hurt me. The clock read 10.32 p.m. on my stove. My eyes stayed glued to that clock for what seemed like an eternity. The neon green numbers eventually ticked to 10.33 p.m. and I let out a breath I forgot I was holding in. 
This is not good. I thumped my head against the cabinet and sighed, taking in the heavy silence. Click. There was a clicking noise now. It seemed so close, but, but I couldn't place its source. Click. 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 I tilted my head, scrunching my eyebrows together as I tried to concentrate. Click. Click. I honed my ears in on the new, unwelcome sound. Slowly turning my head, I looked up at the back door in my kitchen, leading into the yard. Click, click, click. I watched the doorknob twist and pop back into place, and my eyes nearly bulged out of my skull as I realized I was in a new level of danger. This person was trying to break in. At this point, 911 was in my immediate future. I lunged for my phone sitting on the counter. I dialed the emergency line and hid in the pantry, delicately clicking the door into place with as little sound as possible. 911, what's your emergency? She sounded bored, like this was her first call in hours, and she'd just been sitting at her desk, flipping through Cosmo with a rock star to get through the night. Some freaky man is trying to break into my house! I whispered with alarm, dropping the cell phone and picking it up quickly. The speaker piece was in my ear and I I tried to speak into the hearing piece. I flipped the phone around in a panicked rage and heard the operator mid-sentence. Unlikely. So are you sure they're trying to break in? They aren't just a telemarketer? I could hear the rustling of plastic, followed by the operator munching on something crisp. What? Yeah, I'm sure. Telemarketers don't even... Oh, just... Never mind. Just send someone now. A loud bang echoed through the kitchen outside of my hiding place. I peeked through the pantry slats at the man standing in my kitchen, the back door hanging limply off its hinges. He loomed with an energy that exuded ominous and treacherous intent. Looking around slowly, turning this way and that, he surveyed the area. He didn't have any bags. It didn't seem like he was going to take anything. Which only meant he wanted something else. After a prolonged period of silence, the man spoke. Where are you? He said this in a voice that reminded me of a a sinkhole filled to the brim with poisonous snakes hissing and slithering all over each other to collect heat for their cold-blooded bodies. I know you're here, or I would not be. He settled his hands together behind his back and openly walked about my kitchen, peeking into the hallway, the bathroom, and up the stairway before returning to the kitchen. A sickly wide smile beamed across his crooked, cracked, and broken teeth. You cannot hide from me. I can smell your fear. He stood there, legs apart in a dominant way, with his hands relaxed behind his back, smiling. I clasped my hand over my mouth to steady myself. I didn't want him to find me or or even have the possibility to hear my breath. Two tears betrayed my waning bravery as they trickled down my cheeks and stuck to my chin. My body's violent shaking allowed the droplets to pop to the ground as the man turned to the pantry door. He tilted his head to the side. There you are. I let out a frightened gasp, and he laughed in what seemed to be a sick and twisted delight. Come out so we can play. He coaxed, taking slow steps towards the door, head still cocked to the side at an angle that made me nauseous. In this moment, there were two options. Fight or flight. Being a young girl in her mid-twenties, having never experienced anything similar in her sheltered life before this moment, running made all the sense in the world. The pale man's slender, bony fingers gripped the doorknob of the pantry and opened it with a rush, a loud slam erupting into the room as the door smashed into the wall. I screamed.
screamed as loud as humanly capable and lunged out of the pantry, armed with a neon yellow mop that I swung furiously like a panicked monkey gone bonkers at the zoo. The mop cracked the man in the head and he cried out in rage, stopping the mop in his grip before I could strike him again. Releasing my impromptu weapon, it bounced on the tile and I sprayed him in the face with pepper spray before running through the living room into the main hallway. I fumbled with shaking fingers to undo the lock on the front door. Tears streamed down my cheeks and blurred my vision. I could hear his agonizing screams. You fucking bitch! He wiped his eyes and bumped into walls as he attempted to follow me. A lamp crashed somewhere behind me. I punched the door in a frightened rage. Open, damn it! I shouted, banging on the knob and finally getting the lock undone. I swung open the door and didn't look back as I heard the glass embedded in the door shatter. I sprinted down my driveway, right past the dirty blue van and into the street, screaming my head off for help to anyone who could be listening. Footsteps plodded behind me, trailing along my path onto the main road. There were no streetlights or cars, just me this bizarre, pale ghost of a man, and the darkness of the night. I sprinted up the hill toward the main intersection of Maple and Warner, where streetlights fully illuminated the road, and a convenience store gleamed like the lights of heaven just on the other side. I can make it. I just need to get there, and I'll be safe. I just need to get there. I huffed. My legs aching as I pushed them to continue sprinting up the hill. I laughed in exasperated joy and relief when the convenience store came into view. I didn't even stop at the intersection. I kept running off the sidewalk into the street. I didn't even see the blue van speeding toward me. Before I could stop, the blue van collided and slammed me into the windshield. My body rocket launched down the street in a flurry of glass shards, like something out of a poorly produced action film. I landed into an old oak tree with a sick, crunching thud. And the last thing I saw through the blurring, bloody remainder of my eyes was someone getting out of the blue van. The pale blonde man. How? He was, he was right behind me. How did he do that? As I slipped into the black abyss of unconsciousness, I saw another figure emerge from the shadows. The figure came into the intersection's light and stood next to the pale man. Both men stared at my mangled mess of a body mashed against the old oak tree. Both men smiled a sick, toothy, broken smile, followed by giddy laughter. They, they were the same. They were both the same man, completely identical in every way. How? They walked toward me in sync, and the world sank into darkness. The next day, things were normal for the most part. My morning routine was the same, nothing particularly out of the ordinary. I dreamed about the rosemary spread. Thinking back, I wonder if my subconscious was more in tune with my surroundings than I was. Coming home that night, I scanned the roads for the blue van with the muddy wheels. The roads were congested, as usual, around the five o'clock rush hour. I sat at the intersection just before turning onto Maple Drive. I stared at that street sign until my eyes ached. I felt like, like it was important, but I needed to figure out why. The same street sign was there yesterday and the day before. Nothing special. The light turned green and I made my turn. There was not a blue van in sight. I pulled into the driveway and looked up at the window I was standing in the day before. The curtains were closed as I would always have them. Today I did leave a light on upstairs to give the impression someone might be home, just in case they came by while I was gone. I've had the strangest feeling inside me all day, like I'm dreaming while wide awake. I sat in the driveway for a while, scrunching my eyebrows together in quiet contemplation. 
Today went so well, but why do I feel like something has changed? No, something hasn't changed. This day, it, it already happened? No, that couldn't be true. But, but why do I remember this? Well, it's not like I don't do this daily. I talked to myself as I unlocked my door and took one long glance out at the world before closing the door. Once inside, I brewed my tea and took a nap. I blinked awake groggily some hours later, the moon gleaming through my living room window, the smell of settled tea wafting by my nose. Walking through the hallway, I flipped the light on and headed up the stairs to get some laundry started. Closing the washer and setting the dial to delicate on cold, the washer beeped to life and began to process its purpose. Satisfied, I closed the door to the laundry room and turned to the stairwell, freezing mid-step. Standing at the end of the hall was the man dressed in all black, his hands folded behind him, and he stared me down as a pit bull does raw meat. His bloodshot eyes impaled me. So, we meet again. How's your head? I'm impressed. The man said with that same broad grin, yellowed and all. The fuck are you talking about? Get the hell out of my house! I shouted, seizing my limited opportunity to back up into my bedroom and slam it in his pale freak of a face. I pushed the dresser in front of the door and tore apart my bedroom, looking for my cell phone. Three knocks and raps on the door. If you're looking for your cell phone... <laughs> Mommy says hello, the man said through the door, laughing maniacally in his own amusement. I kicked the dresser in response. Eat me, prick, I shouted, suddenly wishing I had listened to my mom and just had the landline phone installed for emergencies. There was a pause, and then the maniacal laughter ripped through the air. <laughs> Gladly, the man shouted and giggled with joy followed by the horrible cracking sound of wood as he repeatedly beat the door with his foot to break it down. Shaking, I scanned the room for a makeshift weapon. I went into the bathroom and closed the door, locking it. I heard the banging continue as I searched, the sound of cracking wood pounding in my thoughts. Searching through drawer after drawer, I found only a small set of scissors and razors to use as my defense. Fumbling with the razors, I looked up in the mirror for a moment and screamed. There, standing in my shower, watching me, was the pale man. He launched from the shower, laughing as I sprung away from him, screaming bloody murder. He grabbed my shoulder and I took the opportunity to take one of the razor blades and clap around his wrist, skinning him as he cried out in pain. Blood ran down his arm, and I released him, running out of the bathroom while he remained there cursing, occupied by his injured arm. Now back in the bedroom, the dresser had been knocked over, and the first man, now halfway, stepped through the huge hole he had kicked in the door. Oh shit, now what? Looking around the room, I spotted my table lamp, and an internal light bulb lit in my brain. You can't run now! Nowhere to go! Nowhere to hide! He pulled his other lanky leg through the hole and stepped off my dresser smoothly, staring me down. The other man came through the bathroom, bleeding and notably pissed off. I want the first draw. She cut my damn arm! He growled my way, pointing at bloody gashes streaking along his forearm. The first man gave him a look and casually waved his hand and the cut twin grinned and wasted no time in stomping my way, arms stretched and reaching to strangle the life out of me with blood-soaked hands. I backed away in the direction of my nightstand, and when close enough, I reached behind and took hold of the lamp. He dangled me above the ground with a strength I had not expected from such a slender person. He gripped my neck so tight I felt my face redden with pressure. My eyes bulged slightly, and I began to sputter for air. The lamp was still in my fainting grasp, and I used every bit of energy I could muster to smash him in the face with it. He screamed, 
releasing me and covering his face as wedges of sharp ceramic fell to the floor, followed by large, seeping pools of blood. He flailed wildly and gripped me by my hair, slamming my head into the other dresser. The flat screen swayed and toppled over with a loud crash. As the first twin joined in, I pulled the scissors from my back pocket and stabbed them into the side of his neck without hesitation. Shrieking, the man fell to his knees and then toppled to the floor, drowning in the blood pouring from his body. The body twitched awkwardly. I stood there, watching him waste away, feeling triumphant. Kneeling, I gripped his blonde hair and pulled his head up. That's what you get for breaking into my house, you piece of shit. I released my grip and let his head smack the floor with an audible thump. As I stood up, I felt hands take hold of the back of my shirt and was instantly reminded I had only won the battle, not the war. It's time for you to die, not my brother. He looked me in the eyes for a long moment. I stared into bloodshot orbs filled with hatred of most humankind before he let out a roar of maniacal laughter. Tightening his grip, He lifted me off the ground in one mighty swoop and sent me flying through the upstairs bedroom window. Falling felt so surreal as the world seemed to reduce to slow motion. The second story pulled farther away as I closed in on the cold, hard earth. I landed with a crunching thud, all my bones shattering instantly. My eyes stared listlessly into the moon and stars taking in the moment before pain destroyed me. Stray pieces of glass fell around me, plenty already wedged in my arms. A large shard jutted out of my ribcage. The last thing I heard were sirens in the distance and the sound of agonizing screaming ripping from my throat as my body collapsed into internal shutdown. The pale blonde head popped out of the broken window above me, waving at me tauntingly, with the same wild grin plastered on his face. I sobbed, salty tears and blood dripping down into my mouth. Closing my eyes, I welcomed my fate. The world sank away into the abyss, and I felt myself release into the safety of death. Birds chirped outside, as I woke to sunlight shining through my bedroom window, the news playing quietly on the flat screen. Sitting up, I looked around my bedroom, remembering everything that had happened. The blue van, those psychotic twins, running me over, breaking into my house. The full-on war scene that transpired in the room I sat in now was perfectly laid out as if nothing had ever taken place. Being thrown out the window and dying sprawled out in a bloody, broken mass on the lawn. Dread washed over me, and I felt nauseous. Nothing bad ever happened. Why was this happening now, and why the hell was it happening to me? Why do I remember these things, and how am I even still alive? After a strong cup of coffee and quiet contemplation, I called in sick to work. I wasn't lying. I felt sick in the head. That counts, right? Today was not going to be like every other day. Today, the game has changed. I will not be the helpless victim to whatever time loop hell those twin freaks have unwillingly roped me into. This is my house. It's my game now. Headlights filled the living room as the blue van crept into the driveway just after 10 p.m. The stuttering engine died and the lights vanished into the darkness. I stood in the entryway towards the back of the house, tucked into a corner and out of sight. I waited there, breathing shallow breaths. Somewhere outside, an owl hooted and crickets made their presence known with their high-pitched chirps. Moonlight bled through the front door. After long moments of silence, the twin shadows appeared silhouetted within the glass frame. Click. It was time. Click. Go on. Open it. 
Click. Click. Smiling, I slinked further into my hiding place as the lock unhitched and the door creaked open. The twins stood there for some time, staring inside. They stepped into the home, closing the door behind them. Standing in the hallway, the house fell into dead silence. One twin moved with slow steps, and the floor creaked under his weight. The other followed, and the creaking continued as they ventured inside. They passed me and went to the dining room. Emerging from my hiding place, I trailed quietly behind them, tiptoeing along and matching their steps to avoid unnecessary creaking. Where is she? I don't know. This isn't part of the plan. You suppose she remembers? Maybe another dose is for our report. I tightened my grip on the baseball bat in my hands and prepared myself to deal out a dose of get the fuck out of my house with a side of dead on my living room floor. We could bring her to the lab for more testing if her memory did retain the events after going through the time shift. Testing? Time shift? Who the hell are these people? That won't be necessary. I said, swinging the bat around, bashing the twins behind the head simultaneously, and watching them topple limply to the floor in a crumbled pile of flesh and bone. I stood there a moment, staring at their unmoving bodies, feeling sick to my stomach. Am I part of some weird government testing, without even knowing I'm a participant? Can that even happen? Is is that legal? Nothing about this was legal in any way. Lost in thought, I didn't notice one of the twins stirring awake. Caught off guard, the man gripped my ankle and dragged me into a painful split. I cried out in painful surprise. My ankle twisted and cracked under me, and I flopped to my side to release the pressure. He took hold of my shirt and climbed on top of my stomach, pinning me to the floor. The other twins stirred off to the side as he began to regain consciousness. Laughing maniacally, the twins sitting on me tightened a hand around my throat and clenched as hard as he could. I choked and gagged, flailing my legs. Why? I croaked, twisting and squirming to no avail. Because it had to be you. Too complacent, unsuspecting, nice. Naive. Perfect. He said, grinning ear to ear. He laughed again and leaned his hand close to my eyes, sticking two fingers out and motioning toward me. The fingers poked my eyes and I screamed, pulling away as best I could and flailing my legs. He persisted and poked deeper. I could I could hear his fingers squishing around, and I felt blood and God knows what else running down my cheeks. I screamed louder. Using all my energy, I lurched forward and smashed my forehead into his, sending him toppling backward off of me. Leaping to my feet, I ran upstairs, loud banging footsteps following behind me, and I rounded the corner of the upstairs hallway. Pulling the door to the attic down, I swiftly made my way up the ladder and waited in the corner behind the opening for Tweedledee and Tweedledum to follow. I wiped the back of my hand across my cheek. Looking down, my my hand was covered in blood. The creak of wood sounded as the twins ascended to the attic. As they entered the attic space, I sparked a match and looked at it with a bittersweet smile. Looking down, I smiled at the gasoline. I had poured all over the attic floor. Making eye contact with the twins, they stared at me in disbelief. What are you doing? One asked, taking a wary step forward, and I let out a wild, maniacal laugh. (laughs) Winning! I dropped the match and jumped down the hole to the second story. The attic immediately erupted into flames and I heard the twins screaming in fear. I pulled the ladder up and closed the attic door, knowing the fire had started in front of their only exit and was rapidly spreading to every crevice it could consume, including the twins. Stomping and screaming ensued above me as I calmly pulled out my cell phone and dialed 911. 911, what's your emergency? 
I took a deep breath and said, Hi, I would like to report a fire at 221 Maple Street. I was driving by just now and it looks like there's a fire starting in the attic. Better hurry before it spreads to the other townhouses. After wiping my face, I slipped my coat on and walked outside as the roof exploded in a roar of flames. I pulled out of the driveway as sirens began to sound in the distance, rapidly increasing in volume as they traveled closer to their destination. Pulling onto the main road, I drove through the evening in silence. I stopped when I was a good 200 miles away and pulled into a lone restaurant in the middle of nowhere just off the highway. Sitting at the bar, I ordered a cola and some french fries to go. As I waited for my road snack, the news came on with the still photo of a building engulfed by flames. With the headline, Local House Fire Triggered by Gas, Two Casualties. Sir, would you mind turning up the TV? I'd like to know more about the fire. I looked at the waiter behind the counter, and he nodded. Sure thing, little lady. He turned the volume up and the news reporter's voice became clear. 10.32 p.m. this evening. An anonymous tip called the local authorities and reported the house fire you can see burning here behind me right now. The fire department is having a grim time extinguishing the flames as they appear to have been triggered by gasoline spread across the attic. What's more concerning is there appear to be people trapped inside the attic. Upon arrival, the screams could be heard from down the street. However, as the flames spread, the firefighters could not reach those inside, and the screaming has since died down. Their safety is currently unknown as the fire department battles these massive flames. More to come as you report live on the scene. This is Rebecca Trulio with Channel 5 News. Be safe out there. Here's your meal. The waiter set my drink in front of me with a greasy brown paper bag. I thanked him and left the restaurant. Sitting in the car, I thought about everything that had transpired. About how I spent the last 20 years living the delusion that I was immune to experiencing those bizarre stories on the news. Now, here I am, driving into oblivion, unsure about everyone and everything in my life. I still don't know who those men were or any strange experiments they were involved in that, that I'm involved in. I don't even know if my memories are, are mine. Terrible. I can only hope that they are. I am not the same girl I was a few days ago. Experience has a funny way of doing that to people, changing them. This may be a blessing in disguise. I get to start over now, find a new town far away from here, create a new image, be a new me. I'll find a home in a nice area, read my books and steep my tea. I'll go to work and do all the normal things normal people do. And nothing bad will ever happen. I hope you enjoyed Repeat Offender, as written by S.M. Small and performed by Danielle Hewitt, Michelle Kane, and Nick Goroff. If you enjoyed Danielle's performance, you can hear more of her on the Chilling Tales YouTube channel, where she holds the third place championship title for 2019's Evil Idol competition. You'll also find more of her work on the Wicked Library and Creepy Podcast at www.creepypod.com. Voice actor and 2016 Evil Idol champion Nick Goroff's talents can be found on our very own Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, as well as past episodes of the Simply Scary podcast. You can also join Nick on his YouTube channel, Wizard of Cause. On that note, be sure to check out the other shows we offer on our network. We have Horror Hill, airing Thursdays for your hardcore, more brutal offerings. Drew Blood's Dark Tales airs Friday, featuring some southern down-home horror. Fear from the Heartland airs Wednesdays. Longtime resident Otis Jiry has a show on Sunday nights that features two stories on the Standard Edition, as well as two more which can be accessed through our patrons' area. Now, 
Our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us, please, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host of the evening, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.